recent work with my colleagues here at Stanford, we went about studying whether opportunity matters in a more systematic way by using big data to study why some children seem to have much better chances of success than others. And we started by thinking about the American dream, a complicated concept that means different things to different people, and distilling it to a simple statistic that we can measure systematically in the data, which are the odds that a child born to parents in the bottom fifth of the income distribution makes the leap all the way to the top fifth of the income distribution. So kind of the classic Horatio Alger version of the American dream. So how common is that in the United States versus other developed countries around the world? In the US, your odds of rising from the bottom fifth to the top fifth are 7.5%. That compares with 9% in the United Kingdom, 11.7% in Denmark, and 13.5% in Canada. Now, some people, when they look at these statistics initially, they react by saying, oh, even in Canada, your odds of success don't look all that high, right? Only a 13.5% chance of succeeding. Now, you have to remember, of course, that no matter what you do, you can't have more than 20% of people in the top 20%, right? And so the maximum value that this statistic can take at some level is a 20% chance of moving from the bottom fifth to the top fifth. So these are actually quite large differences in rates of upward mobility across areas. The way I think about it is that your chances of achieving the American dream are almost two times higher if you're growing up in Canada than in the United States. Now, this sort of, these comparisons across countries have motivated a lot of concern that the US is no longer a land of opportunity. And they've received a lot of attention, but I want to focus, what I want to focus on here today is the fact that there are actually much larger differences in upward mobility even within the United States, and I think we can learn a lot more from that. So in recent work with uh, my research group here at Stanford, we analyzed big data drawn from tax and social security records on 40 million children and their parents in order to construct this map which shows you the geography of upward mobility in the United States. So this map shows you the same statistic that I started out with, your odds of reaching the top fifth conditional on starting in a family in the bottom fifth of the income distribution. And it's colored so that lighter colored areas represent areas with higher levels of upward mobility, and darker areas represent areas with lower levels of upward mobility. So let's take some examples. Here in the Bay Area, your odds of rising from the bottom fifth to the top fifth are 13%, comparable to the numbers we saw in Canada and in Denmark. Rates of upward mobility are also very high in Salt Lake City and in Boston and in the center of the country, where you see in the brightest colors, your odds of rising from the bottom fifth to the top fifth exceed 16.8%, higher than any country for which we currently have data. On the other end of the spectrum, if you look at the darkest red colors, look at places like Atlanta or Charlotte, your odds of going from the bottom fifth to the top fifth are below 5%, lower than any developed country in the world. So even within the United States, there's an incredible spectrum in children's chances of realizing the American dream and climbing the ladder. Now in this big map, your eye is initially drawn to this broad regional variation, but there's a great deal of variation even much more locally. So let's zoom in to the Bay Area and look at the data at the county level. You can see that if you're a child growing up in San Francisco, your odds of climbing from the bottom fifth to the top fifth are remarkably high, 18.5%. In contrast, if you're over in Alameda County in Oakland, your odds of going from the bottom fifth to the top fifth are only 11.4%, nearly half the chance of climbing up the income ladder. So naturally, the question of interest to us as academics and to policymakers is to understand why upward mobility is so much higher in some cities than others and what ultimately we might be able to do about it. And so the first point I want to make here is that childhood environment seems really critical in driving these differences. The way we reach that conclusion is by studying five million families that have moved across areas in the United States. And let me summarize that analysis with the following chart. So let's think about a set of families who move from Oakland, which as we've established, 
generates relatively poor outcomes for kids growing up in low-income families. So to pick a number, let's say that children growing up in a low-income family are earning about $30,000 on average when they're 30 years old. And let's consider a set of families who move from Oakland to San Francisco, where, say, children who grow up and live in San Francisco from birth earn $40,000 on average. Now, what I want to think about is an analysis where we have a set of kids who moved from Oakland to San Francisco at different ages, starting at age nine, which happens to be the earliest age we're able to look at in our data, uh, all the way up to age 30. And what we're going to look at is how their earnings change depending upon when they make that move from Oakland to San Francisco. How much of that gain do they get by making that move? So if we start by looking at the data for children who moved when they were exactly nine years old, we see that they end up about halfway between the kids who grew up in Oakland from birth and the kids who grew up in San Francisco from birth. They're earning roughly $35,000. Now let's repeat that analysis and look at kids who moved when they were 10, 11, 12, and so on. And what you see is a really striking pattern, which is the later you move from Oakland to San Francisco, the less you're earning as an adult. You see the steadily declining pattern in terms of the gain that you get. If you move after you're about 22 years old, you get no gain at all, and you see that you end up with an earnings of roughly $30,000, regardless of when you move after that point. So what do you see from this chart? First, and most importantly, you see that it's not just that the kids who live in Oakland are different from the kids who live in San Francisco. Moving a given child from one environment to another dramatically affects that child's outcomes. Second, you can see that it really seems like childhood environment is critical. Moving when you're an adult doesn't do a whole lot for you. It's really moving in your formative years that seems important. Third, you see that every extra year of exposure while you're a child to a better environment seems to improve your outcomes. Moving at 10 instead of 11 or 15 instead of 16 continues to have a beneficial effect. So given that evidence, we, we see that upward mobility varies a lot across places in the US, and we see that childhood environment really seems to matter. What does that mean in terms of what we can do about this problem? There are really two ways you can think about increasing upward mobility. One is to help children move to these higher opportunity areas, the brighter colored areas on the map. In the US, we spend about $45 billion a year on various types of affordable housing policies. But unfortunately, most of the housing vouchers and other types of affordable housing that we create ends up putting families in relatively low opportunity, high poverty areas. So I'm working now with my colleagues to set up a large scale set of experiments in 15 cities around the US where we're trying to get more of these families to use the money the government's already spending to rent apartments and houses in higher opportunity areas, which we think could really have a dramatic effect on increasing rates of upward mobility in the US. Now, naturally, you can't just move everyone from one city to another. That, that's not a scalable solution, right? And so the second approach, which is wh what I think we ultimately need to think toward, is figuring out how to invest in places with low levels of opportunity in order to replicate the successes of the areas where we see great success. Now, in order to do that, we need to understand ultimately the recipe for success. What's making places like the Bay Area or Salt Lake City have such high rates of upward mobility? Now, I don't have a definitive answer for you there, but what I can show you is a set of patterns that seem to be strongly correlated with these differences in upward mobility across areas. We've examined a number of factors, and I'm going to show you the five strongest correlates of differences in upward mobility across places. The first is that cities with higher rates of upward mobility tend to be less residentially segregated. Now, you can measure segregation in various ways. Let me just show you the results with a simple picture. This map illustrates racial segregation in Atlanta. The way it's constructed is that each person in Atlanta is represented by a dot, and the dots are colored so that whites are blue, blacks are green, Asians are red, and Hispanics are orange. You can see that Atlanta is an incredibly segregated city, with the green dots completely separated from the blue dots. And corresponding to that, Atlanta has one of the lowest rates of upward mobility in the United States. In contrast, look at Sacramento, which has the same fraction of minorities, blacks and Hispanics, as Atlanta 
but look at how much more interspersed the dots are in Sacramento than in Atlanta. Consistent with that, Sacramento is one of the places with one of the highest rates of upward mobility in the US. So places that are more residentially integrated tend to have higher levels of upward mobility. Second, places with less inequality and a larger middle class tend to offer better opportunities of climbing the income ladder. Third, we find that places with more stable family structure, more two-parent families, lower rates of divorce, tend to also have much higher rates of upward mobility. Fourth, and closely related, we find that places with greater social capital, for instance, Salt Lake City with the Mormon Church, uh, tend to have much higher rates of upward mobility. Sort of the old adage that it takes a village to raise a child, someone else will help you out even if you're not doing so well yourself. And then finally, perhaps not surprisingly, but importantly from a policy perspective, we find that places with better public schools tend to have much higher rates of upward mobility as well. So these five factors give you a sense of the types of things we need to think about in order to increase upward mobility. So let me wrap up by talking about what I see as some of the policy lessons from this body of work. First, at the broadest level, I think what these data show you is that we should be thinking about tackling upward mobility at a local and not just a national level. I think this is a very empowering lesson because it shows us that even in an era of gridlock at the national level, there are things we can do at the local community level to increase upward mobility meaningfully, such as trying to improve the quality of schools, increasing the amount of integration, perhaps by changing zoning laws, and so forth. Second, as I've tried to stress, it looks like childhood environment is really important and focusing on things like primary education can be incredibly valuable. Finally, at, at a broader level, I hope this analysis illustrates that harnessing big data to develop a scientific evidence base for economic and social policy can be extremely powerful. Much as we hear about the use of big data to improve the provision of products like Amazon and Google for, for marketing purposes, our vision is that big data can be incredibly powerful in improving economic and social policy. Now, what do we stand to gain from doing all this hard work? Let me come back to the statistics that I started out with on your odds of climbing from the bottom fifth to the top fifth of the income ladder. I think you can look at these statistics in two different ways. One is a pessimistic view. You can look and see in the US, you have only a 7.5% chance of rising from the bottom fifth to the top fifth. It's too bad that that's actually now much lower than most other countries around the world. I take a more optimistic view. I see these data as presenting an opportunity and a challenge. There's an opportunity here because we see that even within America, there are places like San Jose here in the Bay Area with a 13% chance of climbing from the bottom to the top, or remarkably Dubuque, Iowa with an 18% chance of climbing from the bottom to the top. And so the fact that there are such places within America shows that it can be done. We can revive the American dream in other parts of the US. The challenge for us as researchers is to figure out exactly what changes we need to make in order to replicate the successes of places like Dubuque. And the challenge for all of you in the audience is to enact some of these solutions and take local action. Thanks very much.